Everything that happens, happens for a reason. And sometimes you have to be put through the fire so you can be refined. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Our guests both have had rich legacies in the world of Western sports and know the highs of winning, but also have felt the sting of defeat and how God walked them through it all. World champion rodeo athlete Tyson Durfee and his wife, country music artist Shay Fisher, and former champion bull rider Cody Custer. When cowboy Tyson Durfee met Australian country music artist Shay Fisher, he knew Shay was the woman he was supposed to marry. But Tyson didn't know how much Shay's love for him and for God would ultimately change his life. Over the years, as Tyson and Shay grew in their marriage and their spiritual walk, they relied on God to carry them through some of their toughest moments, especially when they couldn't see their way forward. I'm Tyson Durfee. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a Christian. Other than that, I'm a world champion rodeo athlete, I'm a husband, I'm a father, and I'm a cowboy. And I am Shay Fisher Durfee. Um, I am Tyson's wife. I'm partly Australian. I guess now I live in the US, so I've been here now for 10 years, uh, born and raised in Australia. I grew up in a rodeo family, um, but then I branched into music. So I moved to Nashville in 2009. And then we, I met this handsome cowboy and it brought me to Texas. So I'm, I'm Nashville, Texas, Australia, all put in one. So for me, I grew up on a ranch in Savannah, Missouri. It's the northwest corner of Missouri. It's where uh, Jesse James used to ride and rob banks and do all that stuff. Growing up, I was a, was a cowboy, you know. Uh, my mom and dad got divorced when I was really young. Um, was raised between both households until I was 10, and then I moved with my dad full time. And when I was with my dad, we would ride horses pretty much every day, all day long, we would ride. When I was really little, I didn't really want to be a rodeo athlete. You know, I wanted to be a, a Spider-Man, and then I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. And then, you know, later in life, I thought, well, I can make money with this rodeo and stuff. This is going to work out. So then I really got dedicated with the rodeo stuff from about 12 on. So my dad is a eight-time Australian champion rodeo athlete. He rode bulls and bareback roads, so he was the all-round champion in Australia. Um, from as far back as I can remember, we lived on the road. So um, at a young age, I was living on the road, basically living the same life our daughter lives with us, traveling from rodeo to rodeo. Uh, my mum is also a bow racing champion. She's won several titles in Australia as well. So I think I won my first rodeo when I was six years old, junior event, of course. Um, and then ever since I've ridden horses. So um, it's definitely something that came naturally to me. I was born in a rodeo family. Um, I think music came through rodeo, um, being at rodeos, hearing all the country music songs that were getting played. Um, my parents lived in the US when I was nine, and that was when there was Reba and Garth Brooks and Tim McGraw and all those amazing artists. And um, the amount of miles that we traveled, we listened to a lot of cassettes back then. So um, that was where my love for music came in. When I left the ranch, I, my pro tour first season, I was 19 years old. Uh, I had won pretty much everything in the high school and amateur ranks and I thought that I would be the, just the next hot shot you know, on the road, but I didn't really know what the road meant. I didn't realize that you leave home for you know, eight months a year and you don't come home at all. And so it took some major adjusting for me. I had a terrible first season, uh, lost my entire life savings, which was a pretty pretty big upset to me at that point. Um, felt like I was a failure to my dad and my family and everybody that believed in me and I actually quit. I came home and I quit and I started a welding business. And I did that for a few years and, and then I went back to rodeoing. I'd saved and saved and saved and I spent my entire life savings again. Except this time when I spent my life savings I had found credit cards too. And so I had maxed my credit cards out at about 20 grand. And so not only was I at like zero the first time, this time I was actually below zero because I had to pay those credit cards back. And uh, long story short, you know, I stayed hooked and I started winning and started going and kind of figuring it out. Like there's a big learning curve and I lost everything I had twice. I was living in the backseat of my truck, uh, just rodeoing around. I'd bum showers from different people when I would get somewhere at a rodeo if they had a, a trailer or something and it was, it was not something that I really ever want to go back to. I can tell you, it was tough. I slowly began to win, uh, started traveling, 
uh, really going more than just like uh, Canada and the US. I was the first person to win a Canadian national championship, first American to win a national championship in Canada. And then I started making the finals. Um, and a few years later, I met this beautiful lady right here. When we met, I, I knew who he was. Our recollection of the meeting is a little different, <laughs> um, his to mine, but it doesn't matter all in the end, we ended up together. But I mean, you can tell it if you want. I seen her at Houston Rodeo uh, 2010, and I was just like, wow, who is that girl over there? Short like, version today. Okay, I'll give the short version. <laughs> I was like, wow, who is that girl? And immediately it was like God shot down a ray of light on her and the wind blew her hair back. And this is just all this, you know, internal vision that I had. I thought, man, I've got to talk to her. I walk over there and I'm like, hi, how are you? And she says, like, fine, thanks in her Australian accent, which made it even better. Like not only uh, was she beautiful, but then she had an Australian accent. I knew immediately at that moment that I was gonna marry her. And the next day she sent me a Facebook message just saying, nice to meet you. I took that as an open door policy to, you know, just really get in there. And I asked for her phone number and to go out on a date pretty much every time we messaged for yeah, he a was very persistent. Maybe? He kept asking for my phone. Like, he would write a message and then ask for my phone number. And I'd answer everything but the phone number. Yeah, I mean, I was living in Nashville. Number. I was singing. I was on radio tour. I had a song out on radio. I mean, the last thing I wanted to do was be tied down. But I definitely didn't say no to Tyson because I loved his friendship and I wanted to just have him there for when I felt like I was getting more She wanted more me there for when down. she wanted me. <laughs> so um, I actually needed tickets to a rodeo one day. So I reached out to Tyson and he... He agreed to give me the tickets to my parents as long as um, I would go to dinner with him. So I bargained and said, well, how about breakfast? Yeah, so, no dinner. So we did breakfast and, um, and then we just kept in touch for about the next yeah. six months or so. And then I told him that, um, I mean, my dad's an Australian champion rodeo athlete. So I said, if you want to date me, you're going to have to ask my dad. So when my parents came over for mm -hmm. the national finals, he asked my parents if he could date me and then the next year at the national finals, he proposed. Uh, sorry, he asked if he could marry me, and uh, not to her. I asked her parents. Yes, and then we got married. We got engaged. Um, New had, Year's Eve. I had in New planned York. a trip to New York on New Year's Eve, and the plan was to propose uh, in Times Square during the ball drop. I didn't realize that there was like a million people there. In the movies, there's always like you know like 50 foot per person, you know, and there's tons of room. Uh, come to find out, you have to be there like. 24 hours ahead and you have to stay there. So that wasn't gonna really work for me. So we ended up, uh, we went to Central Park by the Bethesda, Bethesda Fountain and literally I started into my spiel about why I wanna marry her three minutes before the ball drops. I asked her to marry me, she says yes, and one second later the first firework goes off. Impeccable timing, it was God's timing. I couldn't, I was not, I'm not that good. So, so romantic. My parents weren't raised in a Christian household, but they both got saved when they were around 23. Um, in Australia, the rodeo industry um, is not as Christian based as it is in the US. So um, they definitely had to stand up for their beliefs and it wasn't the cool thing at the time. Um, but I've been blessed because I've always been raised in a Christian household. From as far back as I can remember, we were in church and Sunday school. And, um, and that's always been very important to me, even with our daughter, to make sure that she has a good foundation, knows the Bible stories and things like that, um, because that's definitely been a part of my life. So I think when I met Tyson, there was a couple things too. I knew at the time when I met Tyson, he wasn't as strong in his Christian walk as I was. And I had dated some guys in the past and I had thought, well, you know what? I can just change them or it's okay. They'll become a Christian. But I always went back to the scripture that my parents put into me as young, young girl, don't be unequally yoked. My relation with Jesus and, and my Lord and Savior really started, I seen those seeds getting planted when I was really little. My mother is a devout Christian. She had sown those seeds and those foundation into me, you know, so deep that I didn't even know that they were there. It was just kind of in a tough environment because like when I lived with my mom, we would go, you know, weeks without electricity. We would never have food in the house. I would sneak to other kids' houses just so I could have something to eat. Um, I was running with the wrong kids. I was skipping school, every learning disability class. And, and my mom was just this really big optimist that, you know, we're gonna be okay, I'm gonna make it. Of course, she was a single mother with two kids trying to raise them in a 
heavily an urban environment with a lot of distractions. So she was just struggling and trying. Pretty much as we got older, my brother and I got too wild for my mom. Uh, she couldn't handle us anymore. And so she sent us to live with our dad on the ranch. And when I went to the ranch, values, human values, were up of the most high thing that you could do. If you shook a man's hand, that's the way it's going to be. If you told him it was going to be some way, it was going to be that way. But we would tell dirty jokes. Uh, there was whiskey and beer every single day. Um, there was, you know, women coming and going. So, I mean, it was just like this um, very polarized environment. And it wasn't until I left uh, and got out in the world that I realized that, okay, these things that I know as a young man aren't the things that are going to propel me to the, the future that I want, right? Shay asked me in 2011, June 2011, are you a Christian? And I really wanted Shay. And I had that Christian base, but it was a long ways back. And I was like, yeah, I'm a yeah, Christian. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you told me yes. I'm like, yeah, I'm a Christian. And, but I had this Bible in the dash of my truck that was given to me by the people who later baptized me. So I opened the Bible. Every day I just start reading, you know, new te it was a New Testament Bible. I'm reading about this Jesus and I'm reading, you know, uh, about James and, and I'm reading through James. And it's just like so much wisdom just blew my mind. Like James 1, 1 19, truly I tell you, every man should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. And I was the exact opposite. I didn't want to listen. I wanted to speak and I got angry because I'm an Irish redhead that likes to fight. And then it's just like it got a hold of me. Like it grabbed me during the same time I was getting to know Shay. And when I go in, I go all in. I don't do anything at 50%. I go 100% with whatever I decide to go after. And it just, it, I picked up the Bible and it grabbed a hold of my heart. It was just that transition and it was truly amazing for me. I remember when we were, we were dating and I think I, I had got a Jesus Calling book and I had said to Tyson, you need to read this. And, yeah. um, and I think he was traveling. So I was like, you know what, download the app onto your phone mm -hmm. so you can read it every day. And, um, and we would read it together every we night would before, read it together before we and to bed. Sometimes I'd skip ahead or skip back and just kind of see what was on my heart that day. And I have hard copies of this book and it's on my phone and my app. And I just love how worldwide it is because once I knew about it, I introduced my mom to it and there were some people in Australia that weren't saved and she told them about it and then just hearing the stories about how, how it's helped so many people in life. and That is so true. So in 2016 I, I won the world championship but it was kind of an amazing year. Like I just felt... Amazing but the worst year yeah, we had Yeah, it was prior. the worst. <laughs> It was the worst year leading up to qualifying for the national final. I mean, everything that went wrong could go wrong. We blew up two trucks on the road. Brand or, new trucks, too. Yeah. Uh, generator problems left and right, constantly outside the top 20. I was um, a lot of months pregnant at the time. She was very <laughs> pregnant, like very pregnant. And it was just so tough. Like at one point I was ready to give up and go home. Like I was ready to be done. Um, long story short, I ended up qualifying for the national finals in the 14th position. Uh, they take 15 to the national finals rodeo. Leading up to the last few final days of competition, I would spend 30 minutes reading my Bible. I would spend 30 minutes stretching and it's kind of a dark room. Then I would take a shower and I would go get ready to compete. On the seventh go round of the national finals, uh, I am in the shower, just get done out of the shower, and I'm putting the towel over my face, and the, the Lord just like spoke to me immediately. And he said that, I am with you. And I'm, I'm getting goosebumps right now just mm -hmm. talking about it. And I'm like, I just wanted to like fall down on my knees and cry because I was so, you know, shook by it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But when you hear the word of the Lord that vivid, and that audible, it shakes you to your core. It really does. And from that moment, coming out of the shower, I knew I was gonna be the world champion. Even though the math didn't look like it, the numbers didn't look like it, there was just literally almost no way that I could be the world champion because I was so far down in the pack. But where you don't see the way, God sees the way. It's the truth. Went on to win the world championship coming from nearly the very last person in the pack. 
If you were to point a linear trajectory to where I started, to where I ended with my ability, there would be a straight line to that point, right? Okay, and then from that point, there's a dotted line leading to the world championship. Where I was capable of winning a world championship was from this dot to that dot where the line was connected. Where the line was not connected, where there was dots. That's where my faith filled in the space that I wasn't good enough. That's where my faith and my belief in my Lord filled in the gap to get me to the world championship. Mm -hmm. And that's what God will do in your life. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus will do for you. Yeah. It's important we to remember that. If you can't do it, God will fill in the gap. To get the latest on Tyson's life in and out of the arena, follow him on social media. You can find updates on Shay's music at shayfisher.com. Stay tuned for our interview with former professional bull rider Cody Custer after a brief message about a free offer from Jesus Calling. Want a daily reminder that we can have hope, peace, and joy each day in Jesus? Now it's as easy as opening an email. The Jesus Calling Daily Email brings you a thought from the Jesus Calling family of devotionals every day. Brighten up your inbox with this little reminder and take a minute to connect with God during your day. To sign up to get your free daily thought from Jesus Calling, please visit jesuscalling.com slash daily dash email. That's jesuscalling.com slash daily dash email. From the time he was a little boy, Cody Custer knew he would be in the rodeo. Even through a series of tragic events that happened when he was young, Cody was still able to succeed in Western sports and took many prizes before retiring after 20 years of being an athlete. As Cody looked toward life after his rodeo career, another unexpected tragedy forced him to reevaluate everything he held dear. My name's Cody Custer. Uh, rode bulls professionally from 1983 to 2003. I started riding calves when I was five, so most of my life I was in bull riding. So in 1972, my brother and sister died in, in a carbon monoxide poisoning. <clears throat> it led us away from anything to do with God, let's put it that way. There was a lot of partying going on around our crew and stuff, and I got into, you know, heck, 11 years old, I was smoking pot. And at that time, mom and dad were partying, and there was a lot of stuff going on that wasn't wasn't probably the best for our situation and stuff, but but really behind it is just hiding. They were just they were just trying to hide the pain, you know. And so uh, the church we went to had put a lot of pressure on them in 1972 after the kids died, and uh, they they just left because there was so much pressure. And I don't even know if everything happens for a reason. I, I believe there's a reason in the middle of what happens. Uh, my mom grew up you know, ranching and rodeoing, and, and so I went on my first roundup when I was four years old, so I've been a cowboy or been around it my whole life. I don't know if I'm much of a cowboy, but I've been around it a whole lot, and kind of savvy some of the things just because I grew up around it. Um, gosh, we were, we were at a rodeo almost every weekend. Uh, 1979, life was pretty good. My dad was a silversmith, and built really nice buckles, and my mom, she worked with him and stuff. and. Uh, he broke his neck in a horse accident um, that year. Dad was paralyzed, and, and uh, it just it put us in a, in a different position. And where he he was always a, a physical guy, and, and uh, he had to rely on God. I don't believe that God never had, you know ever takes his hand off any of us, no matter what we're doing, no matter what we're you know what's going on in our lives. So. I really kind of fell in love with bareback riding, which is another event in rodeo, and, and through high school and, and uh, starting into the professional level, that was kind of what, where I, that's really where I was focused. I, I still rode bulls, and I rode bulls good. I had success and stuff, but I, I really was thinking about pursuing bareback riding. When I got to the level of professional, the, the quality of the stock got a little bit stronger, and, and so I found out that I didn't ride bucking horses as good as I rode bulls. So um, so the bull riding kind of take took over at that point. I was able to I was able to make a living riding bulls starting, you know, nineteen eighty five 
86, I ended up probably just outside the top 20, or maybe just inside the top 20. I didn't make it to the national finals, which is the top 15. I got to go out to the national finals and watch from the stands, and, and I saw guys in the arena that I felt like I rode better than. And so it was just a, it was a kickstart to the new year, made me really get disciplined and get really focused on what I was wanting to do. 1987 through 1992, I qualified for the national finals consecutively. And 1992 uh, was just the year that, that everything fell into place and, and uh, had had great success. I mean, it, I set I set an earnings record that year. In 1993, shortly after I won the won the world title, my my wife had been pregnant. She had she gave birth to our first boy, Aaron, on uh, on March 7th, and so that was awesome just to be able to bring a life into the world and get to know him. There was uh, five years in a row I had certain, I had injuries that, that cost me the year. I had always based my success on how well I did rodeo on, and I could, I was still riding good, but I was just having these injuries and stuff. But looking back on it, it was a time in my life when a lot of stuff was developed in me that that's that comes to life now where I got to see my boy grow up, you know, I got I got to see the first five years of my boy's life. Looking back on all that, I really wouldn't change, I really wouldn't change things, um, just because of the way I went. I, I see God all over it in the middle of it, on top of it, in and out, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, I think, <clears throat> I think people get too wrapped up in circumstances and, and forget that uh, circumstances don't, don't really have the, they're not the end all. I went on to have you know a good career. I finished riding bulls in, in 2003. I'm not riding bulls anymore, and I'm trying to find out and really figure out exactly where I fit in the world because I'm not a bull rider anymore. So we moved to Oklahoma in 2007, and uh, I, I quit my position with the PBR and I just stayed home quite a bit. And my boy became a he became a man in uh, the summer of 2011 was rodeo and bought his own trailer and was paying his way that way. And so he decided to go to college in Weatherford, Oklahoma. The day before classes started, him and his buddies were, were coming home from, coming home from, uh, well, they had, a, they had a rodeo meeting that night and then they, what well, kids, they did at 2 a.m. But they, uh, they were on a road that nobody, none of them knew. And it was a straight road, just, uh, had a had a jagged curve in it, and the boy driving survived the wreck. <clears throat> told me that he had put his dims on because there was a car that went by, and uh, he never put his rides back on. He never saw he really never saw the corner until they were in it, and he overcorrected. They went off the creek. And my son and, and uh, Ed Drury both died in that car wreck. I used to get up every morning and read my Bible and. and Talk to the Lord and stuff. And I was up that morning, and a, a bang came on the door, and I opened the door, and I, I'd seen the scene before in a dream. And uh, it, was a, it was a police officer, my pastor, and his wife there, and I knew they didn't have to tell me what happened. You know, probably the worst thing that could possibly happen to a person is losing a child. And, and uh, you know, Aaron, he was our first kid. He, I mean, there's a lot of first experiences we had with him. It was, it was a pretty rugged time, but I can't say I don't have a rougher time with it now than I did the first few years. I mean, it's been it's been seven years since since Aaron went back to the father. But in the in the aftermath of that, we had we had so many people that called us and told us what Aaron meant to them. People we didn't know. I mean, he he, he met so many people, never knew a stranger. Anyway, I learned a lot. Learned a lot more from my boy than I would ever thought I did. You know, he just taught me a lot of stuff. Somebody gave me this Jesus Calling book. I don't think I started it in front of the year, but I I stayed up with it fairly consistent. And uh, and uh, the day that Aaron was the, the morning that we got the, the call that, or got the, the the news that Aaron had passed, um, I had read. I had read. The devotional that day and so for a few days there was kind of a fog there i went back and looked it was august 16th of 2011 i went back and looked and aaron was aaron was killed somewhere somewhere around 2 30 or 3 in the morning and i'll just read august 16th it says meet me in the early morning splendor 
That's the first line. And, and so to me, that was my boy. My boy went back in the presence of the Father right in the early morning splendor. You know, this book, this is just a book of words until the Spirit hits it, and then it's life. And so to me, it was a, it just gave me a, maybe a little bit of a rest or a peace of, of uh, you know, he's back with the Father where he, where he belongs, where we're all handed him. Everybody grieves their own way. Grieve how you grieve. You know, there's no, there's no cookie cutter way to grieve. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm no counselor, but I have been through some stuff. Just go ahead and do it the way you're going to do it. But uh, don't back down. Don't give up. Uh, keep moving forward. And uh, can't lose that way. You can learn more about Cody's faith and his writing clinics at CodyCuster.com. If you'd like to hear more stories about learning to trust God when life gets tough, check out our interviews with NFL Hall of Fame wide receiver Tim Brown and Super Bowl champion quarterback Jeff Hostetler. Next time on the Jesus Calling podcast, we speak with Pastor Jonathan Pitts. When we talked with Jonathan, he reflected on some of the most important lessons he learned in his 15-year marriage to his wife, author Winter Evans Pitts, who died suddenly at the age of 38. That's the beautiful thing about marriage. I think if there's a commitment to love and sacrifice and lay down for each other, then you're always going to be growing, and there's always going to be something else to lay down. Um, so that would be my, my continued encouragement to you year by year is it's never perfect, but, it, but if it's intentional, it's always progressional. Do you love hearing these stories of faith weekly from people like you whose lives have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling Stories of Faith podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like what you're hearing, leave us a review so that we can reach others with these inspirational stories. And you can also see these interviews on video as part of our original web series, with a new interview premiering every other Sunday on Facebook Live. Find previously broadcast interviews on our YouTube channel on IGTV or on JesusCalling.com slash video.